Hi, guys. As mentioned, Nora is teaching ecology this semester. She is a full-time lecturer in the biology department. So you will see her around, and you may even take a class from her, or you may have already taken a class from her. So thank you. Thanks, Colin, for the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, to the inaugural um, time of Lunch and Learn. Uh, I was brought in kind of last minute to pinch hit on this. So I think this should be about the right time. Um, but I don't have a watch. So if I'm going over time, just kind of wave at me and be like, wrap it up. Um, get a hook and pull me off. So as my title suggests, um, and as Colin already mentioned, by school year, I am a lecturer here at Tufts. And during the summers, I'm spending a lot of time um, out in the field, all different parts of the US, and I'm studying butterflies. And my work has been largely funded by the Department of Defense. And I sort of gave a tongue-in-cheek title here when I was thinking about this last minute. Um, so it's really about doing conservation with unlikely partners. And in current funding climates, very often we have to explore unlikely um, sources of funding to figure out how we can best keep our science going. Um, and the Department of Defense actually throws a lot of money at conservation issues. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why they do that. So when I tell people that I work for the Department of Defense studying butterflies, they imagine that my work is really dramatic. Um, they think that I'm like in fatigues out in the field doing really dramatic things. Or the more tinfoil hatty type people think that we're weaponizing butterflies, perhaps, um, training them to be spies or something like that. It's nothing so exciting um, in that way that you might think. The real reason that the Department of Defense is interested in conservation of all different sorts is because they are gigantic landholders. So things like the Army Corps of Engineers, the Air Force, um, the Marines, all sorts of different groups hold vast tracts of land. And this is obviously incredibly zoomed out because you have the scale of the whole United States. But you can still see that they hold gigantic parcels. And there's a little scale bar down at the left-hand side there. This is you know, on the scale of hundreds of miles across some of these parcels. So they can afford to sit on gigantic pieces of land. And very often, the sorts of things that they're doing, um, exploding incendiary devices, having drop zones for paratroopers and things like that require a large buffer. So the actual portion of any one of these areas that's being used for active military training might be small relative to the whole um, area. And a lot of the areas that provide a buffer from the military for suburbs and other things are actually full of endangered species. And it's especially true in areas where there's really heavy development. So in some cases, um, these um, Department of Defense lands are embedded in places that are very heavily um, urbanized or they're very suburban. You know, you've got subdivisions butting right up against the edge of these places or agricultural fields. So these actually act as refuges for um, endangered species. And there are some endangered species that only exist on Department of Defense lands. There's a charming little butterfly called the St. Francis Stater that is only found at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. It's been wiped out from all of the other locations where it used to live. So just like any other entity, the Department of Defense is bound by the Endangered Species Act. And they're very concerned when they have endangered species on their land that the activities that they're doing, um, the troop training, the bombing, and all these other things, how are they impacting the endangered species? So a little bit of their budget, which from a science funding perspective is gigantic to us, goes to studying all sorts of endangered species. To give you an idea of the scale of the land they hold, the Department of Defense, through various different entities, holds about 25 million acres of land. So you imagine that that's a lot of space for endangered species to reside. So when I was working as a postdoc, um, I was studying a charming little blue butterfly that is found in the Willamette Valley. It is found on military land, although I studied it on an adjacent excuse me, wildlife refuge. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I did out there. I'm just going to give you a brief outline. So we were really thinking about disturbance. A lot of the species that we find on these military lands that are endangered are species that are associated with disturbance. And you can imagine things like driving tanks through prairies and having bombing ranges induces disturbance. And in some cases, it induces a fire regime that's really more akin to the historic fire regime in some of these places, where they would have burned um, semi-regularly. 
So, you know, you toss a grenade or you're dropping small bombs, you're lighting little fires that are creeping through the understory. That might be much more akin to the fire regime in some of these places, where now in all the surrounding areas you have people's homes and agriculture, and there's a real history of fire suppression since people have moved in heavily to these places. So things that are fire adapted, that evolved in areas where it would have burned fairly frequently, often um, end up congregating in these places of high disturbance, these military installations. Um, one such species is the Fender's blue butterfly, and I'll show you um, some charming pictures of it in a minute. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the methods we used to figure out how fire was affecting these guys, and then some results. So how do we understand how to conserve a species? One way of doing it is sort of what we call the field of dream hypothesis. So here you have some sort of physical environment, and if you can just get the physical environment right, um, the plants will come in, and that will create habitat for the animals that you're interested in. They'll colonize this um, area that you've constructed for them, and then you have success. So you've helped the conservation of the species by building a place for it to live. Um, in the case of disturbance-dependent species, like the Spender's blue butterfly, this often involves bringing in the historical disturbance regime in which these individuals involve. And in this case, um, it involves reintroducing fire to some of the areas. So disturbance is a fundamental process that's really interesting to ecologists. It's something that happens naturally. Sometimes these disturbances are man-made. In the case of Fender's blue butterfly, they evolved in a prairie that was burned um, at least semi-regularly by native peoples for the past tens of thousands of years and probably had some uh, historical fire regime associated with lightning even before that. So as ecologists, we seek to understand disturbance and try to figure out how uh, we can use it to manage species of conservation concern. So this project was really designed to do two things. Um, we wanted to understand how prescribed fires, so fires that we set to manage the species, affected this endangered butterfly. And also, we wanted to think about how this might affect dynamics. So um, here we have source sink dynamics, which you guys might not be familiar with. But basically, when you burn a habitat, that year it might be bad for the butterfly, right? You may end up um, killing some of the individuals that are living in the area. And that year it might be a sink habitat. So the population growth rate might be small or less than one. Individuals aren't replacing themselves. But if you've done a positive thing in that sort of field of dream framework we're talking about, ultimately, Hopefully, you create a source habitat. So now the population is growing in this area, and individuals are being exported out of that habitat into other areas. So what were we actually studying? So some charismatic pictures of butterflies. So this is the Fender's blue. It is named for the males, which are this lovely blue. I think the females are also quite attractive. They're this um, sort of lovely teddy bear brown color. Um, they are found in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, so any of you guys that are uh, familiar with the Pacific Northwest, this is the big agricultural valley that is in between the Coast Range and the Cascade Range, sort of akin to the Central Valley in California. Um, and just like the Central Valley of California, it's very heavily agricultural. If any of you guys have played the, uh, the reintroduced version of Oregon Trail, I played it on like a Commodore 64 when I was a kid, when the first computers, but I know they've reintroduced it. This was where the end of the Oregon Trail was. So it was this beautiful, verdant, fertile valley that was at the end of the Oregon Trail. And as you can imagine, if you were trying to get there in your little Conestoga wagon, it's because the agricultural opportunities were really um, good. So right now, the vast majority of the Willamette Valley is covered in various sorts of agriculture. It's also where about 95% of the people in Oregon actually reside. Um, it's a great place if any of you are old enough to drink wine. You know, Noir grapes grow really well there. Um, and it's also the grass seed capital of the United States. So you go to the Home Depot and you buy a bag of Scott's Turf Builder and you've got your grass seeds. Odds are that those are grown in the Willamette Valley. Now that's all well and lovely. You have these beautiful fields of grass. But these are not necessarily good habitats for butterflies to live in. And they've lost a lot of the native upland prairie that they once resided in. Even the um, patches that are still the right habitat, they're still the prairie, have threats to them. And that's largely because we've lost the historical fire regime. So if you are a prairie, you tend to be disturbance. Um, the vegetation there tends to be disturbance dependent. So 
either there's periodic flooding or there's periodic fire, and that prevents woody species from coming in and eventually turning your prairie into a forest. And forests are well and lovely and nice, but they are not good habitats for fenders blue butterflies. So we have to be concerned not only about native um, woody plant encroachment, but also about non-native species. So things like this tall oak grass, so named because it gets about colon tall by the end of the season, and also things like Himalayan blackberry, which may be choking out um, their host plants. So there's lots of ways we think about um, dealing with this. There are various different uh, disturbance regimes. We can reintroduce mowing. We can um, herbicide some of the nastier species. Um, the one we're going to talk about today, briefly, is prescribed fire. So this is where I actually did the work. It's this beautiful little um, wildlife refuge, sort of adjacent to some military land. We had access issues, so we ended up um, for this species working here. And it has all these little tiny um, fingers of prairie sort of coming down these buttes, which are small hills. And in 2011, um, we went out and we lit fires. So we lit prescribed fires. Um, and there were four different replicate burns, and they are denoted by these um, sort of light gray areas here. And you'll see that the margins are real wiggly. We couldn't just burn a big square because fire doesn't act in predictable ways. Um, and especially in a place like Oregon, where it's fairly wet for a lot of the year, it doesn't always carry. You can't just light a match and have a big area burn necessarily, although now it's drier than it used to be. Um, but you end up with something that looks like this, where this area has been burned, and you see it's burned off a lot of these tufts of this non-native grass, and it's revealed the host plant of these butterflies, which is the lupin. It's in the pea family. So this is what lupin looks like. And just really briefly, the life cycle of the butterfly. Um, males and females are flying around briefly uh, in the late spring, about four to six weeks. They lay eggs on lupins in June. These guys spend some time munching until the end of the summer when um, the lupins senesce, so they die back as it gets dry in about August. They overwinter as little tiny larvae, and in the spring when the lupins re-sprout, they start feeding again, and the whole cycle um, repeats. This is where we typically introduce fire in the Pacific Northwest. This is when it's sufficiently dry that you have enough fuel to burn a fire, but it's just starting the fall rain. So you don't want to burn when it's really dry. The fires can get out of control. You can't burn when it's too wet. This is also the time where all the little teeny caterpillars are hanging out down at the base of these plants that have senesced. So they're basically hanging out in a bunch of lupin straw. And you can imagine it's not great for fire to pass over a lot of these individuals. And it actually induces mortality in some of the caterpillars that are getting ready to overwinter. So what we wanted to determine is are the positive um, uh, effects of fire on other life stages worth losing some of the caterpillars the year that you burn? How do we figure that out? We spend a lot of time crawling around on our hands and knees in poison oak counting things. Um, so it's not as glamorous as you might imagine. You're crawling around on your hands and knees. You're looking for little tiny green caterpillars and little tiny green eggs in lupins, in tall grass. Um, at least the saving grace is that it's not particularly hot in Oregon, so at least you're not doing it in searing heat. But demography is little tiny fiddly work. You're climbing around, you're looking for little tiny things. And we counted 120 meter squared plots of lupin, and we followed them for several years after these experimental fires. So we also surveyed adult butterflies in the spring, so that's sort of the butterfly work that you're familiar with. We're skipping around with butterfly nets, catching adults, and counting them and monitoring them. And we repeated these counts for several years to sort of track the effects of the fire. So what do we find? Um, so these are the demographic results. These are the effects of the, on the population size of the butterflies here. So um, just to orient you, the gray circles are burned plots. These are unburned plots, which are acting as controls. And what we see is that fire kills larvae, right? No kidding. The year that we burn, we have very low survival. This turned out to be a pretty lousy year for um, overwinter survival anyway. And in fact, lots of larvae perish over winter. It's one of the um, sort of population culling points in the life cycle of this butterfly. But the ones in the burned areas do worse because some of them are actually killed by the fire. But what we see in the two years after the fire is that female fenders blues are laying more eggs in areas that were previously burned. What is driving this? So we have increased fecundity, increased egg laying in areas that were previously burned. 
Um, at least partially, this is likely because plants are bigger and healthier and happier in areas that were previously burned. So here you have a nice happy lupin with lots of leaves. It's not being choked out by all sorts of woody or invasive grasses. Um, and you'll see eggs per butterfly go up. This is a uh, changed color scheme. <coughs> Excuse me. But eggs per butterfly go up in burned plots. And there's pretty much a lockstep increase in the number of leaves in these plots. So plants are bigger. So per leaf, you're not really getting uh, more eggs per leaf, but you are seeing more eggs per plot because the plants are just bigger and happier. Another thing we see, um, which we were actually surprised about, is that not only are individuals laying more eggs in these burned plots, but the caterpillars that are in these plots are surviving um, better. So that was a little bit of a head scratcher. We didn't know if there was something about the chemistry of the plants that may have been different. These guys are nitrogen fixers, so they don't tend to be nutrient limited. Um, but we did a whole bunch of chemistry on the plants. We didn't find any signature of that. And then we started to look at some of the other associations of these caterpillars in nature. So we saw this pattern where we had elevated survival in the burned plots um, after the fire. Remember, year one um, is not particularly good for these guys. But by year two, we had this elevated survival. So what was going on here? The first thing you need to realize is that it's very hard to be a caterpillar in nature. Um, you're basically a little, tiny, poorly defended snack pack of protein. Lots of organisms want to eat you, ants and spiders and wasps and birds are all uh, big portions of their diet consist of caterpillars. Fender's blue is not particularly well defended, um, but chemically or structurally. So in a given year, less than 10% of these guys survive anyway, even uh, in the best of conditions. And once they get through winter, everybody wants to eat them. So they have a couple of different ways of dealing with this, just caterpillars in general. You can hide either by making yourself a little tent and staying in it, you can try to be camouflaged and hide. You can be toxic, as is the case of the monarch caterpillar, which ingests milkweed and that doesn't taste very good. Or in the case of Fender's blue butterfly, they hire bodyguards. So lots of blue butterflies have associations with ants, where they basically um, have a little structure on their back. These guys spend all day eating, as caterpillars do. What they're eating is nitrogen poor, but very carbohydrate rich, typically. They have all this extra sugar. So this step, you're turning plant material into uh, caterpillar material. So you have to eat lots and lots of food. Basically, caterpillars, all they do is eat and poop. Um, and they're growing material that's animal material from a plant. So they use a little tiny bit of the excess sugar they get from plant eating to bribe caterpillars. Basically, what they're doing is giving them a sugary reward, uh, sorry, to bribe ants. They're giving them a sugary reward for hanging around. And we see lots of different ants, some of which you can imagine are probably better bodyguards, like this um, Campanotus is probably pretty good at guarding this little ant from other insects and things that might want to eat it, whereas this little tiny guy on the back might not be the best um, bodyguard. But there are all sorts of ants that are associated with these caterpillars. And we see that there is a difference in the association of ants in areas that were burned and were unburned. So, the conditions present after a fire are actually favoring a uh, tighter association and a more enduring association with these ants and uh, the caterpillars. Ants in areas that were previously burned have longer tending bouts, so they spend more time in contact with the caterpillars. So if you go out and you take a blade of grass, sort of harass the caterpillars, you give them a couple of pokes, they will actually signal the ants and blue butterflies do this in all different uh, ways. Some of them have a chemical signal. Some of them mimic the sound of ants screaming. So ants have audio signals that they can give one another. These guys um, do some combination thereof, but they have recordings of them kind of making squeaky ant noises. And it will actually recruit ants. So you poke them, and then you start a timer to say, how long does it take the ant to show up? And once they're there, how long do they hang around? So the beneficial effects of fire is being mediated potentially through this um, trophic interaction with a completely different species. So it's not that the most intuitive thing we thought was, hey, the plants are better. So now these guys are surviving better because their food is tastier. Because after you burn an area, the forage is better. But in fact, it seems that these guys are being protected from some of their predators um, by the ants in burned areas. 
Um, and we also see that ant tending is associated uh, with increased survival. So overwinter survival after fire is higher in these burned areas, and we're also seeing that we have increased lengths of tending bouts. So how does that translate? We see that we have increased um, fecundity in areas that were previously burned, and we also have increased survival in areas that were previously burned. So fire seems to be um, good for these guys, and that's intuitive because these guys evolved in a fire-dependent ecosystem. Um, but what we see when we actually combine all those things together and we do population uh, growth models combining all the different demographic rates is that annual growth rate denoted by lambda here, basically a lambda is larger than one, the population is growing, less than one, the population is shrinking. Um, the year right after the fire, nobody was doing particularly well, especially the um, ones that were burned because we lost a lot of the caterpillars. But in the two years following, we had, um, it was a good year for everybody, but the burn plots did even better. So this is likely driven at least partially by um, favorable weather, although that was not significantly different um, from one, but the burn plots do better because of the combination of increased fecundity and increased survival. And by the third year after the fire, that signature has disappeared, um, at least partially because the woody vegetation starts to come back in. So you have to repeatedly burn these plots to get these um, positive effects of fire. So some take-home points about this portion. Initially, fire is bad. It kills the larvae. But over time, butterflies may compensate for this loss by choosing to oviposit, choosing to lay eggs in areas where um, the habitat is improved in some way because there is more food and also because the ants that they're associated with um, are better at tending in these areas that were previously burned. So now I'm going to switch gears just for a few minutes. That is what I did for my postdoc work. Um, right now I'm just starting a new Department of Defense uh, funded uh, project and this is on, who knows what this guy is, everybody, right? That's the monarch. Um, these are really charismatic. We know that also over the past decade or so, we had lost about 90% of the monarchs. Um, this has actually been two good years in a row now where they seem to be rebounding a little bit. Um, but we're still concerned because we are still far below historic levels of monarch butterflies. And you can imagine, um, if you think back to that map of all of the Department of Defense lands, that they are very, very concerned that monarchs don't end up on the endangered species list because this is the distribution of monarchs. And how many army installations and bases does that overlap with? Basically all of them. It would be a colossal headache to have this gigantic charismatic endangered species on all of your land. So they have proactively tried to get out ahead of the problem and they're funding research to sort of figure out what's going on with this species. Um, these guys are migrating through the central US so they Everyone's probably remotely familiar with this migratory pattern, but they winter in Mexico. We're talking about the eastern population here, the ones that are east of the Rockies. The ones on the west coast do something slightly different, but they both have this north-south migration. Um, there are some resident monarchs down in Florida, but they're moving up and down across this flyway, and the Midwestern U.S. is really a very um, essential part of this flyway, and historically there was a ton of milkweed there. There are dozens of species of native milkweeds in the Midwest. Um, it's far more diverse there than it is along the East Coast. You certainly see some migratory monarchs coming up and down the East Coast. There's a count every year in Cape May, New Jersey, where they go out and count them. You will see, I've seen a couple of monarchs just driving around this morning. They're getting ready to start their southward migration. But the real business is going on in the Midwest. So I have been working um, at Camp Dodge, which is smack dab in the middle of the country in scenic cornfield, Iowa. So you can imagine that Iowa, being what it is, everyone knows it for growing corn, is very heavily agricultural. Um, but there are still some native prairies in this area, and also all of the roadsides and ditches and things um, have milkweed growing in them, and milkweed is a weedy species. Um, potentially one of the things that has been going on with these monarchs is that we lost some of this milkweed um, because we got better at controlling weeds in various ways. Um, now they're having this big effort. They're using some highway corridors to restore connectivity where they're planting milkweed along all of these highways. Um, so we were actually working this time on a military base called Camp Dodge. It's in central Iowa, just outside of Des Moines, which is the capital. 
And we have been out there in their remnant prairies that they have adjacent to their training areas, and we've been monitoring uh, monarch butterflies. So I still have a field crew out there. I had to come back to start the semester. But through the course of the summer, I'll just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. So one of the things that we're really concerned about with monarchs is a parasite called OE. So it's a protozoan parasite. It infects monarch butterflies. It was first noticed um, in the 1960s. And now it's found in every population of monarchs you can imagine. And monarchs are actually found in lots of different places. Um, they're not only in the Americas, but they have introduced populations in Australia. Um, there are also monarchs that do a reverse migration in South and Central America. They all have this parasite to various levels, and the incidence of the parasite varies from year to year. Um, and it has some pretty nasty effects on the butterflies. So this is what the parasite actually looks like. Um, these are scales from the monarch's abdomen. So to test for the parasite, you go out with a little piece of sticky tape, and you just run it over the abdomen of the butterfly. You pull it off and you put it on an index card, and then you look at the um, sample under a microscope. And what you see if they're infected are all these little tiny spores of this parasite. Um, and when these guys are heavily infected, it can have gigantic fitness consequences. So a lot of the consequences seem to be sublethal for most of adult life, um, but we think that they may be failing in very high numbers during migration because we see a much heavier infection rate at the end of the season before individuals migrate that we see in returning individuals that have already undergone the migration. So heavy infections are lethal. Individuals either never get out of the pupa, they die inside, or when they attempt to eclose, they attempt to come out, their wings look like this. And you can imagine that if you are a butterfly that needs to fly around to forage or that needs to migrate, this is a dead end, right? We're going to lose this individual. But even individuals with much lower infection rates may be weaker or may have wing malformations that we don't necessarily see as much with the naked eye that are leading them to die um, on the migratory pathway. So we've been spending a lot of time out in the field. We are um, monitoring individuals in these populations. They go through multiple generations um, in, the, in the Midwest during the summer. And we have these little cages. So this is a common milkweed set out here. We have these little cages over um, individual milkweeds, and we can follow the fate. Again, we're doing this little fiddly work where we're going out, we're counting eggs, and then we're counting caterpillars. And we figure out whether or not uh, individuals are initially infected. So we go out and we take samples of females that we find flying around in the wild. And we take a scale sample, just like I showed you. And we say, OK, is this individual infected or not? Um, infection rates tend to be pretty low at the beginning of the season. We then put females inside these cages. If the plant is not flowering, we give them a little cup full of Gatorade, and they can nectar on that. Um, we only keep them in there for about 24 hours. They lay eggs on the milkweed, and then we start following the fate of all these eggs. So we go out, and we count the eggs, and then we monitor them as they hatch. So these are little, tiny monarch caterpillars. They're doing something very characteristic. So milkweed is so named because it has this milky sap. The caterpillars, if they just start munching, will get stuck in the sap and die. And in fact, the plant kills a lot of little tiny monarch caterpillars. But the ones that are good at it spend some time basically creating themselves a feeding island. So they will go through and they will punch through all of the veins. They will wait for the sap to run out and dry. And then they can use this little island to go in and feed and you'll create all these little tiny windows. So if you are looking for monarch caterpillars, characteristic damage is to have all these little tiny window-shaped holes punched um, in your milkweeds. We follow these caterpillars as they get bigger and they start to, by the time they're big, they don't have to worry as much about getting stuck in the sap, so they're just munching on the leaves wholesale. Then we look at them as they pupate and ultimately follow them until they emerge as adults. We then mark these individuals and follow their fate to see how long they're surviving as they're moving around as adults. So we have mark recapture where each one of these gets a color code and we know the fate of individuals if we recapture them. So with that, I want to thank lots and lots of people. This work doesn't happen with just me crawling around out there counting. Um, this is an army of folks that are all funded um, by the Department of Defense to work on various butterflies. Um, these folks here work on the St. Francis Theater in North Carolina. There's some folks working on the Baltimore Checker Spot. If any of you guys are familiar with Dr. Crone here 
at Tufts. She has also been funded on this same um, contract from the Department of Defense, and they're studying Baltimore checker spots um, here and down in Maryland. It's another charismatic butterfly. Um, this work also funds lots of undergrads to come out to the field to help us. Every year we've had a small army of folks out there helping us crawl around, helping us count um, all of these individuals. And um, this is the actual arm of the Department of Defense, so CERDIP, the federal government loves their acronyms. It's Strategic Environmental Resource Development and Planning. Um, but they fund their budget. It's a very small part of DOD's budget. But they fund lots of work, and it's not just on butterflies. They fund work on endangered plants and amphibians. They have a huge project on the red cockaded woodpecker, if any of you guys are familiar with that species, um, in the American Southeast. And we're also affiliated with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who actually lit all of those fires for us because we were working at a national wildlife refuge. Um, and with that, I will take any questions that you guys might have. If you're not already a subscriber, you can put your name, your email, let us know if you want to get the weekly newsletter or get um, weekly notifications of our lines of learning. The newsletter has been historically a huge deal for undergrads. They find internships, they find jobs, they find information on courses that are coming out. So feel free to sign up. But thank you for a wonderful talk. I thank see you. a hand there in the back. Could you raise your hand? Hey, thank you so much for a great talk. Uh, question about the uh, blue butterfly. Um, did you run PVA on those butterflies for the burn and unburn sections? If, if so, what were the long-term projections for hypothetically like doing prescribed burns or just leaving it alone? Yeah, so I gave you the Reader's Digest version of this, but there have been things where we've done a sort of full-scale population models, and it turns out that the optimal strategy to maximize lambda, to so maximize this population growth rate, is to burn about 30% of the habitat on a return interval of three to four years. So um, doing that, we can actually create pretty decent population growth rates on the order of 1.4, 1.5. Um, they are actually very close to being downlisted. So um, there has been lots of different management. So some places they're burning, some places they're mowing. Um, some places they are doing very hev heavy um, wiping to l eliminate some of the, these taller um, non-native grasses. So we're lucky in that area that all of the native grasses are sort of short bunch grasses. So you can come out with a tractor with a giant boom with herbicide on it and just sort of wipe over the top and remove um, a lot of the invasive grasses. We've also studied broadly in the group the um, sort of potential indirect effects of this glyphosate and other um, herbicides on the caterpillars. It might not be awesome for them, but in balance it might be better than not using it in places where you, it's not practical to burn or mow. Sure. Hi, I, we're, I have a question about the monarch butterflies. Sure. What do you hope to uh, find in your experiment surveying the parasite level? Yeah, so one of the things we are very concerned about, I didn't give you like the whole overarching um, project, but these parasites may be increasing in incidence uh, in response to climate change. So as the uh, climate gets warmer, the growing seasons are getting longer, and when the growing season is longer, these parasites build up to a higher level. It's also possible in a lot of areas where milkweed used to be um, annual, it would die back when it got too cold, that the plants can sort of muddle along through a not very cold winter, and they almost become perennial, and in that case, you lose the culling of the parasites. So typically, in winter, you nearly entirely wipe out the parasite because the plant material dies back, the parasite has nowhere to hang out, and then in the spring, you have a new generation where there's not as many parasites. Um, so we're concerned with whether or not um, the effects of global warming might be playing into this. So the first thing we're trying to do is just figure out how bad is this parasite for these butterflies? We know it's not great. We know when they're very heavily infected, you end up with individuals with curly wings. Those clearly die. Um, but what we don't know is basically the detailed demography 
of all the other life stages. So if you have an infected female, does she lay fewer eggs? Are those caterpillars more likely to die if they came from an infected female? Because there's vertical transmission of the parasite where mom gives it to the babies. Um, and we're just trying to nail that down. How big of a problem is this parasite? One of the hard things about monarchs is that they're all over the country. They're moving through all sorts of different habitats. We know they're declining, but we don't necessarily know exactly why. Some people feel that it's all about habitat loss. We've planted a ton of milkweed. That's not necessarily fixing the problem entirely. So we're worried about what else might be going on. Thank you. Hi, um, my question goes to the lupin, actually. Um, I know there's a lot of lupin up in Maine. Mm -hmm. Do you, um, is it different? Do you see a lot of population for the fender blues there? So, um, fender's blue is only distributed in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Uh, they are specialists on Kincaid's lupin, which is found in that area. They will use spurred lupin a little bit. Um, you do have a ton of lupin in Maine, and you have a completely different blue butterfly that's up there. So there is this very close association where you have um, lupins, and then you have you see blue butterflies feeding on them. Lucy blue or fender blue? It's not Fender's blue butterfly. So Fender's blue butterfly is only found in Oregon on a little tiny piece of Washington. Yeah, yeah but as you go through sort of um, through Washington and uh, Oregon and down into California, you have all of these little isolated populations of blue butterflies that have been isolated by various things and all different species associated on all different kinds of lupins. And you have blues here on the East Coast. Um, the ones that are using uh, the lupins in Maine aren't threatened. Okay. Find that really easy. Yeah. Um, hi, yeah. My name, oh, yeah, sorry, not my name. My question um, kind of relates to what you were talking about with the parasite growth and global warming. And I guess I was wondering, like, how you stay kind of optimistic in, like, the larger context of global warming um, when you're, like, dealing with such a huge climate issue? Sure. So, um, I mean, we were sort of buoyed by the success of the Fender's Blue, so that helps us remain optimistic in that particular case. Now, what is the long-term prognosis for this species? I don't know. They're not particularly mobile. Um, you know, will their habitat shift enough that it's no longer suitable for them? Um, that we're not sure of. The monarch is sort of a different case because they are highly, highly mobile. Um, so if the suitability of their habitat ends up shifting, this is actually a species that can potentially deal with climate change by being able to shift its distribution. Um, now, that's not to say that, oh, they'll be fine no matter how hot it gets. There are some real concerns, especially when they are returning to Mexico in the late summer and early fall. If it gets too warm and too dry in a lot of those sort of southern Midwestern states, places like Kansas and Nebraska and Texas, there's basically nothing for them to feed on. So in that case, we're significantly worried about drought um, in response to climate change a little bit more than temperature because they can move around. But if you just end up with this giant floral desert where all the plants are senescing before the butterflies are trying to migrate, um, that's a real problem. So people are trying to think about what sort of floral resources are drought tolerant and what they can plant you know, in backyards along, what can the highway department do to plant these things along the I-35 corridor that runs all through the, the central US? I have a professional development question. Sure. So, <laughs> you uh, you went to Stony Brook, you majored in biology, did some statistics right. What was the key for you to be competitive in this arena for being able to sort of launch a career where you get to chase butterflies on, on the defense <laughs> land? Live in the dream. Um, so I think getting a research experience fairly early on certainly made me competitive for graduate school, and graduate school is really what prepared me to um, come on to a career at Tufts and to come on to a postdoc. Um, that's not to say that when I was an undergrad, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So, you know, as a lot of kids are when they're small, like I wanted to be a veterinarian, and then I got really interested um, in biology in high school, and I went to my undergrad, and I was taking all these different biology courses, and I thought, hey, I really want to be in environmental science. So I got a research experience working in a... Um, a national lab that was close to my college, 
and I spent a lot of time um, looking at plants, and we were doing phytoremediation. We were planting plants in nasty contaminated soils and then harvesting the plant biomass and seeing how much of the heavy metals and things they had taken up. And that's a way to deal with um, contaminated soils in sensitive areas where you just don't want to go out and scrape off all the soil and bring it to a landfill. Um, and that was interesting work, but I spent a ton of time babysitting machinery that was doing analytical chemistry. So watching a thing pipette and making sure that the, the hose fed in properly. And I didn't find that particularly dynamic. Now, that didn't discourage me and go, well, I don't want to be a biologist anymore. I said, okay, what parts of this experience were interesting to me? And I really liked being outside, and I really liked dealing with whole plants, and I spent a lot of time looking at the insects that were visiting the plants. So that got me a little more um, where I was, realized I was interested in ecology. And that's how I went to graduate school, was the programs I applied for. Thank you, Nora, for a fascinating talk. I'm intrigued, uh, especially about the ant uh, butterfly interaction, uh -huh. well, larvae. Um, the ants you show seem kind of small to deter them against predators like wasps and birds. Can you talk a little bit about how they work together? Is it that they are dependent against other type of predators like parasitoids, or how do they do it? Yeah, so the ants really vary in size. There are some that are incredibly small, um, then there are things like carpenter ants that are actually quite large. Um, we didn't test the efficacy of the different um, ant tending uh, species, although they have done that on other blue butterflies. And it seems that small ants are still reasonably effective in large numbers. Um, they might not be particularly effective against avian predators. They are certainly reasonably effective against like, things like parasitoid wasps that come, al come along and may spend some time sort of hanging out in the vicinity of the caterpillar, determining whether it's the right host. Um, they chemically probe the, the caterpillars sometimes. And in those cases, the ants have time to get there and to deter the other um, insect predators or parasitoids. Anyone that's tried to look for caterpillars knows that the ants are pretty pinchy, too. So even the little ants will get all over your hands and start pinching you if you're harassing the um, caterpillars. And if it's uncomfortable to us, it's certainly got to be uncomfortable to us. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, let's thank Nora once again for launching the series. And I'm sure if you're interested in learning more about how you might get involved in their research, she would be happy to answer individual questions if you want to come forward. Could I have a favor? Um, if everybody could stack their chair in the back corner, it would make our lives really, really helpful. <laughs>